Welkom terug uh, bij Stream 2. Wij gaan door met onze tweede lezing van deze middagsessie. Het is een verhaal over de ghetto en dan over het geluid van de ghetto en de taal van de ghetto. De roep van de ghetto is voor ons allemaal een teken van het voorjaar. En er is veel meer aan uh, wat goed ghettos aan elkaar vertellen op het moment dat ze roepen op het nest, rondom het nest, in het territorium. En ik wil jullie graag um, voorstellen aan uh, André Belvin, uh, die als uh, masterstudent aan de RUG onderzoek doet naar de ghetto-taal. Naar de geluiden uh, van de ghetto. Heel bijzonder onderzoek met heel bijzondere resultaten. En hij heeft voor ons een verhaal meegenomen. Uh, hij gaat het verhaal uh, in het Engels vertellen aan ons. Uh, André uh, komt uit Tsjechië en heeft dit onderzoek in, uh, in Friesland gedaan... En uh, neemt ons mee uh, over wat we weten over de ghetto-taal. En in het Engels is het First Insights in the Vocalization of the Ghetto. En um, André, the floor is yours. I introduced you in Dutch, okay. uh, but uh, you will give your talk in, uh, in English. You can, um, iedereen kan vragen uh, in het Nederlands stellen in de chat. En wij uh, vertalen de vragen en uh, stellen de vragen aan het einde aan uh, André. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone who is uh, listening. Sorry that uh, you have to switch to, to, to Dutch. Uh, let's uh, see what uh, I can tell you about the uh, vocalization of Gruto. So to, to briefly introduce myself, I, I found these pictures uh, very useful uh, because the, it summarizes uh, my work, what I did in the past few years. So the biggest arrow uh, points on uh, the red-breasted flycatcher nest. And the second arrow, that's uh, the automatic recorder that's recording the, the nest communication. And uh, the second, uh, the last arrow, that's, that's me taking picture of this. And uh, the red breasted flycatcher is a very, very cool bird because uh, we can follow individual uh, males and uh, we, can, uh, we can find out uh, how often they, they sing during, during the season, uh, specifically those individuals. And here we can see that uh, how it's related to mating uh, season. So just as uh, the male find the female, uh, it drops the songs. Uh, we can also look at the, the uh, diurnal patterns, uh, how they change during the season. So during the prefertile period, uh, there's nothing like a dawn uh, chorus that we know from, uh, from other birds, that, but that changes uh, during the next three periods when we see a clear pattern during the, the fertile period incubation especially and uh, last nesting uh, stages. Another cool thing about flycatcher uh, was actually related to Netherlands. Uh, when I gathered uh, many recordings from Europe, I got also 15 recordings from uh, Netherlands and, and they were all very unusual. Uh, the, the song structure was uh, very unusual, so I looked more closer into that. And it turned out that they are all from the same place, the Valuea National Park and uh, from 40 years, and uh, I'm quite sure they are uh, all uh, from the same bird. So that was just overview what we can learn from, uh, from one, uh, one specific species about the vocalization. I found it pretty cool. But uh, for my master studies, I decided to move to, to Groningen, so I had to leave a uh, flycatcher behind me. And uh, I was excited about other cool birds that you have uh, in Netherlands, like uh, Hrutos, for instance. First thing I had to do is to find a mentor, supervisor, so uh, I tried to find someone uh, r related to bioacoustics, but no one uh, seems to be specialized in this topic. So I text uh, uh, Professor Tony Spearsma that I like birds and I like sounds, and I was lucky because it seems uh, we met uh, our interest uh, and he seems to be interested too. And uh, one thing I want to mention from this, our first email, for the, the rest of the talk, that we have to realize that uh, the way how we understand bird sounds is uh, really different from the way how they, they perceive the word, of course. So we start brainstorming what we actually know about the national bird of Netherlands, the, the Hruto. Uh, do they have don don chorus like uh, passerines do? We don't know. Uh, I did a small review, and uh, it seems that the, the last uh, work about Hruto is 60 years old, so there's not much uh, new new things about hrutos and uh, the, the the author did not use any microphones at the time we don't have uh, spectrograms and uh, in other shorebirds it's a very similar story uh, the best summary is in a cramp uh, 40 years old uh, book and uh, it's surprising because uh, from based on few studies we have it seems the communication is super interesting uh, 
in a, in a shorebird. So it's been 60 years, but within those 60 years, there was enormous progress in a technology like passive acoustic devices, machine learning, deep learning. So the goal of the study is to explain, uh, to describe as much as possible of vocalization of Kruto using these uh, novel technologies. So methods, methods uh, for, for recording, I, I need recorders. And uh, that's when I was lucky again, because the friend of Toynis, uh, Professor Bart Kempenars from Max Planck Institute, provide us with plenty of uh, very high quality recorders. Second and last thing I need was uh, Gottwit. And uh, that's when I was lucky again because uh, Toynis put me in contact with this uh, famous uh, f uh, farmer, Merck from Bommels. You probably heard about him. And uh, suddenly I appeared uh, in the middle of Netherlands uh, living at his farm. And it was really amazing culture experience as well. So thank you that I could uh, stay there and uh, do, the, do the research. And uh, just give you an overview of what does it mean for, uh, for someone from Czechia moving to a place like that. I compared the number of breeding pairs of, uh, of four main uh, shorebird species with Czechia, with 7 million hectares and 30 hectares of farm of uh, Merck. And uh, we, we beat him in uh, for red shanks only. When we have good year, we can have five more red shanks than uh, Merck. Uh, so it was really like a safari for me. And... Uh, what I did, I placed 20 microphones uh, in a field that were recording 24-7 for a whole season, four months, uh, which resulted in 120 terabytes of recordings, and I would need roughly 20 years uh, to analyze those data. So I would look like this, and I would still not be done, probably. Uh, it's not good, so I decided to use the BirdNet, uh, the deep uh, neural network approach, and supercomputer of our university, to find out more uh, from those recordings. So, results. Uh, penguins. It's uh, not going to be about penguins because the penguins have a very uh, different uh, background and they are not penguins actually, but they are gotwits. So, the first and most striking thing I learned uh, about gotwits uh, at Merck's farm is uh, we cannot uh, study them uh, like I did uh, Red Bessie Fly Kitchen. They, they don't have territory uh, which they defend in a way that they don't, uh, don't overlap with other gotwits. They, they colony, they are really like uh, penguins, and the sound I'm describing is uh, about the colony. What I will show you now are results only from four microphones, because the, the rest is still uh, waiting. And uh, from those four microphones from whole season using BirdNet, I got 2.7 millions of detections of uh, Hrutos. So enormous... Uh, uh, quantity of data uh, which tell us, us that uh, the, the sound is uh, definitely number one in uh, Gottwitz life. They constantly in uh, call phones, like uh, in Zoom calls. So if you look closer at uh, the diurnal pattern for uh, month uh, March, you can see how, how the activity uh, changes during the day with it's fluctuating with a small peak in the night then a big, slightly bigger peak during morning around nine o'clock and then uh, again in the evening. You can uh, scale it up a bit to the whole season and see that uh, this pattern changes a bit uh, for uh, April, May and June when uh, there are two uh, distinctive uh, uh, peaks, one in the morning and another in dusk, which is quite different from the flycatcher, for instance, which has no activity during the uh, evening. And then there is July and you can see flat line, of course, when, uh, when the gotwits uh, flew away. Uh, I think take home message for people doing monitoring could be that the best time go out and uh, look and listen uh, for Gotwitz seems to be eight o'clock uh, during May. Uh, so it, lo it would look like that. That's the best time go out and listen to, to, to Gotwitz. Another thing I did, I, I was curious about uh, the, the phases of day, uh, if they, they vocalize during night, if they vocalize during sunrise, during day, and how they vocalize during uh, dusk. So this is quite a complex, maybe graph, uh, at uh, x-axis we have time in uh, five minute intervals. And uh, at the y-axis we, uh, we have days. So each line is one day split in five minutes intervals. And uh, I counted how many calls were detected within those intervals. So this is whole season, all data we have basically, how, what, what we got. Plus, I, uh, there are uh, vertical lines uh, representing uh, Dawn, if I go from left, then uh, sunrise, the yellow line, then uh, sunset time, and uh, dusk time. 
uh, and what we can uh, see in this graph, for instance, that uh, during the first month, uh, there, were, there were almost no uh, calls during the dawn or dusk period for, uh, for uh, Gottwitz. So they arrive, and not like flycatcher, but ra rather later they start vocalizing during, during the season. This is a graph for uh, the dawn. If I, if I take like, the dawn and, and uh, f flip it uh, on the side, so we have now season at the, at the x-axis. And I look how it's related the production of uh, the song during dawn uh, to a number of p birds that were incubating at the time. That's the red line. And you see how it's nicely related. So, so a few days before the first birds start uh, incubating, they start increasing, and they were increasing with the increasing number of nesting pairs. Then there was slightly drop with the peak of a uh, nesting period, but then it continued uh, to grow again when uh, probably the chicks uh, uh, left the nest. Another cool thing, uh, gotwits are uh, vocalizing at night a lot, especially at the start of the season. Uh, again, if I flip just the night time, uh, and we, we see how it developed uh, compared to uh, nesting period, we see that the peak of nest calls is just a few days before the peak, the highest number of uh, uh, birds incubating. So it must be related. And then there is drop. We, we cannot hear Godwitz during night anymore uh, in the second half of the season. Uh, maybe it could be interesting to look at other species, what we can get from the bird net, because I'm getting information about all species. So for instance, Skylark, we, we see nice, nice pattern, no, no night activity at all, clear uh, day pattern. But uh, there is no dusk, uh, dusk uh, peak as we saw in, in the Gotwit. Uh, and another interesting thing, there is not dawn uh, chorus peak as we would expect like in Flycatcher, but there is rather something like midday peak. So it's, it's shift and uh, it seems the best time go out to listen for Skylarks is uh, around 12 o'clock. So uh, interesting. Uh, another uh, cool birds that were in the area is uh, uh, oyster catcher. And it's also a bird that's very active at night, like, uh, like the black-tailed godwit, uh, especially at night, actually. They, it seems they're doing some territorial flights for me. They're flying from one meadow to another. They start leaving uh, late uh, with the start at night and then coming back uh, at the end of night, it seems. Then they are in a field, mostly silent. And once uh, there's a sunset, they start vocalizing again. and. Uh, start moving across the fields. And uh, at the top, then we can see the circle when uh, they had chicks that were very active also during a dawn period. Another interesting uh, are widgeons. I thought always about widgeons like uh, there's a duck, boring duck, that uh, they are not uh, doing much sounds and definitely not in night because they are sleeping at night. But uh, uh, the opposite is true. They are like uh, owls, and uh, especially before, uh, during the migration, when there were hundreds of uh, widgeons in the area, they, they were very noisy in the night. Uh, and same story for shell ducks that uh, also breed in the area and very noisy. OK, uh, now in the second half talk, I will talk more about the, the nest uh, communication that uh, I, I analyze a bit in more detail. Uh, what I did, I placed extra microphones to those recording in a grid also to the nest. And I follow those nests 24-7, uh, which means whole incubation period. And I got, again, quite some uh, hours of recordings. And from those uh, recordings, uh, I use some uh, quite complex semi-automatic workflow. And I analyze, I will not dive into it, just that I got 80,000 detected calls from those uh, recordings, which is already uh, quite interesting and surprising that the bird they, they, they don't feed themselves uh, on the nest like passerines do, but they do some calls there. Why, why they do it, why it's even interesting that they communi communicating at nest while not uh, feeding, for instance. Uh, and uh, if you look at the seasonal pattern, uh, for all nests, we see a quite clear uh, horizontal line across a uh, whole incubation period. So they're calling every day the same amount, but then there is a big increase at the end of the incubation period when uh, they have uh, chicks they are communicating with chicks. Uh, uh, however, the, the amount of calls between nests could vary a lot. So there must be some personality preferences that some birds calling more than others. We can also look uh, on the um, f uh, amount of calls between day and night. We see that mostly, mostly they use the calls uh, during day, but around 15% also during night. 
from all those calls, I could I could divide all those calls into five uh, distinct uh, groups uh, of calls based on structure. Uh, the most common was uh, call type D. I will talk more about it in, in, in soon. Uh, but they use all of them. And uh, what was very cool, I think, uh, is when you look at the loudness of calls, that uh, two calls, the call type A and D, were super, super quiet, silent. If you would be two meters far away from the, from the nest, you cannot hear it. But then there were two calls, B, B and C, that were very loud. You, they, they were meant to be uh, com communication with other gotwits on the, on the long distance. And now let's, uh, let's listen to the call A, which is the one very, very quiet. So that's a bit of a mystery call. What we know about it, that they use it mostly during the midday period. They, they don't use it during the night. They use it when they are alone at the nest. And that's all we know. And also that it sounds a bit like uh, from, from space. <laughs> So if you would have any suggestions, uh, I would be happy, <laughs> happy to hear because I have, to be honest, no idea what, what they mean. Another call is very loud. It's a call type B. And uh, if you follow the video, you saw another bird flying over, over, over this uh, the bird. And that's exactly what this call is about. It's probably some territory or social bonding call. So when there is another bird flying over, they always use the, this kind of call to, to say, hi, this is my, my nest, my area, don't, don't come too close, for instance. Uh, we see also the diurnal pattern with the high speak in the evening. Not very clear why, why, why it's like that, but uh, it's like that. <laughs> and we can listen and see the spectrogram. Okay, I skip it, but that's uh, not, so, not so important for now. Another call, very important is a warning call, C call. So what this, what they, wh why they use this call, it's always when there is some predator flying over nearby and when they see the predator, they use this warning call. If the predator is too far, they don't care, they just warn others, hey, there is a predator, be careful. But if it's too close, they also leave the nest, uh, of course. And they use more of these calls. Now, the, the, the predator, if you watch the video, was quite far. It was marsh harrier. And they, this bird used it just once, and they uh, continued in the incubation. We see almost the same pattern as for the, the previous call. And we can go to other call, call type D. There's a call for everything. They, they use it when uh, they go to nest, when they communicate with chicks, for everything. You see, you maybe saw that uh, they're not moving the beak uh, at all. So they, all, all the sound that they, they produce, they produce from a uh, deep throat. And uh, the pattern, it's uh, with three peaks, you see, mostly during the day, morning, midday, and evening. And the last call is uh, call E, my favorite one, because every time they use it, or almost every time, there is another bird in a, in a distance responding to this one. So uh, I'm suggesting that this call is something like, I'm calling my partner, where are you, come to the nest, it's time to change, or uh, are you okay, I'm okay, something like that. So we can uh, try to listen to the other bird in the a, in a background. Yeah, so another bird was responding. Uh, they, they use it mostly during uh, the afternoon hours, and uh, it's, it's called type E. And uh, we can also, just to give you overview what, what kind of data we can, we can get, this is one, one day at the nest of one bird, uh, split, literally we see different calls during whole day, how, how it changes, uh, that sometimes they use the call type D, then they change to another one. So it could be very detailed. And uh, during the hatching period, uh, they, they change it a lot and they, they use a lot of those D calls in these long uh, bouts of calls uh, and pr probably supporting chicks uh, to, to get out of uh, the nest. And uh, last two, two cool observation things, there's something I called watchmen. So every time when I went to the field, 
there was one bird coming towards me. But why, why it's interesting, there was only one, all the, the, the field is full of birds, there's only one bird coming towards me and calling, hey, watch out, there is a predator coming. And if I went to other part of the field, there was another, only one bird coming towards me. And I could also go for, around, and again, there was another bird coming towards me, but only one, uh, unless I go really in the center of the, of the field. So for me, it almost seems like they, they decided that there's gonna be one bird at the edge of the, of the colony who is coming and warning others if there is a predator coming. And others can continue breeding that they are not calling all of them, just, just one. Very cool. And lastly, uh, predators, buzzard. Uh, if there is buzzard really high in the sky, I realized they're using a special type of call for, for that. Uh, and you can hear it in the middle of the recording now. Yeah, so it was the very long uh, call in the second half when there was a buzzard, uh, they, they start using this call and it worked super, su super great. Every time they, they use it, there was a buzzard in, a, in the sky. So maybe we can use it for monitoring of uh, buzzards actually. Uh, I can continue, they, they're using other uh, calls for, uh, for marsh area, but as long as the marsh area does not fly very high, then switch and they use the same ca call for a buzzard as for marsh area. So it's not about the species, it's much more about the context, where is the predator. They use, uh, they don't use it uh, during non-breeding period, that's, that's, that's clear, only during uh, chick period. And uh, if there is a small mammal, then they're using this uh, different call behavior, different calls, the same for roe deer or, or for me. So overall, the end, take home message, uh, what, I, what I presented is really just uh, top of the iceberg. Uh, because they're using many other calls, like I, I did not talk about the famous Gruto call that needs to be uh, analyzed, I did not talk about the flying calls, uh, I did not talk about cheek calls, there's plenty of uh, other calls and uh, it seems very complex and interesting. So, uh, do you speak Gruto? Thank you for listening. Thank you all. André, thank you very much for this uh, thrilling um, um, overview of the uh, sounds of the um, Godwins, the Gutto. And um, I'd like to pose um, some questions. There's one um, uh, that was uh, asked in the, in the chat, and that uh, links to um, uh, your explanations on um, the, uh, to your link that you laid uh, between the uh, recordings and the behavior. So the question is whether you also um, uh, had video um, uh, continuously or sometimes to really make make that link. Yeah, um, yeah if you talk about the, the nest recordings, mm -hmm. I, I used to have uh, some uh, some nests were partially recorded with camera, so I can couple like pair the, the context with with the sound, uh, but uh, ju just a bit and. Uh, Given the the observation in the field, I was I didn't mention, but I was mostly in the field observing what's going on there, uh, writing notes. So if there was a buzzard passing, I wrote it where exactly, w what time it was passing, and then I wanna 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 pair it with the with the sound recordings to see if it's really the the, the true what I was seeing observing. Okay, thank you. I, I'm just uh, going to translate it. Um, the vraag was uh, of er ook uh, video observaties uh, begeleidend werden gedaan aan de uh, recordings van de, uh, de audio recordings en um, uh, André heeft uh, dat bevestigd. Hij uh, heeft uh, voor een deel uh, bij de nest uh, geluiden ook uh, met video gewerkt en aan de andere hand ook met veel gedragsobservaties in het veld. Um, and I have an, another short question. Uh, you talked, uh, uh, you also uh, gave um, some hints at individual differences in uh, the vocalization. I'm uh, very thrilled uh, in hearing um, uh, your, your links that you could do uh, between uh, different uh, vocalizations and different behaviors. So I acknowledge that this is already a really big step forward. But the, so the, um, the, but the next question may be, how much difference is there between individuals? And, are, and then maybe the next question even, but that's probably for the future, how much, dif um, how much um, difference is there in 
success <laughs> of a breeding success, for example, of, of birds if they mm. talk more, if they are yeah. more talkative. Very Can you say something yeah. about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, very, very good question. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, the uh, individual the part that's uh, that's clear that there are individual differences in the, in the structure, of course, mm -hmm. but also in the amount that some are more talkative mm -hmm. than others. But uh, for instance, when I look at the the sea call, uh, the the warning call, I realize that two nests that were in the other part of the field were using much more of this uh, sea call than uh, than uh, the other birds. So, so I believe that it's related that the the area. Uh, was much more exposed to predators and uh, that could be related to behavioral success when they have to warn more often because they are predators or they are more often dist uh, disturbed it could have negative effect on, on the on the fitness in the end or maybe not because they're calling a lot and it does not seem to sound is uh, something uh, that would cost them energy or they, they do it all the time okay so there's a vast scope for uh, yeah, for yeah. future research exactly. <laughs> thank you um, uh, ik ga het nog heel even vertalen. Uh, er is, uh, veel, uh, zijn veel individuele uh, verschillen uh, tussen uh, dieren. En um, ja, even in een notendop, uh, daar is nog uh, weinig onderzoek naar gedaan, uiteraard. Um, uh, en, maar het is zeer uh, waarschijnlijk dat er dus uh, ook een duidelijke link te leggen valt uh, met um, ja, individu individuele, um, individueel succes, uh, broedsucces van dieren. Uh, en, uh, ja. Dus dat, uh, dat is iets voor de toekomst. Um, Thank you um, for, um, for coming, for sharing all the results um, uh, with us. Oh, there's uh, one, uh, one more question coming. Um, um, uh, yeah, I just read it uh, as it's presented here. Uh, the frequency uh, of, for example, the predator warning um, varies during the day. And does this mean uh, there's a difference in um, alert, alertness during the day? Absolutely. How, how, how it changes, the, how, how the predators change their behavior during the day, it's related to, uh, to those uh, warning calls. So we, we saw the evening peak that there, there is uh, more of the predators or passing gulls, for instance, uh, coming over the area at the time. So that's why during the day it seems they are very chill. There is not so much going on and then uh, they much more. Uh, uh okay. So that's interesting. So um, the, the, het antwoord was dat er een rechtstreekse uh, verbinding is uh, tussen uh, de uh, hoeveelheid uh, van uh, of de frequentie van de uh, predator um, uh, alertness um, um, uh, roepjes <laughs> um, en uh, het daadwerkelijke, um, de daadwerkelijke kans zeg maar, voor het optreden van de, van de predatoren. Dus uh, er zit een heel uh, dagpatroon uh, achter. So um, I um, I'd like to conclude now um, because we also have to switch to the uh, to the other session. Thank you again for uh, for coming, and um, we'll um, I just have don't have the book here now, but uh, we will um, give you a book uh, for the the Dutch uh, breeding um, or the Dutch uh, Vogel Atlas uh, for you um, uh, as a um, thank you for uh, for coming. En uh, voor alle luisteraars, um, we gaan om uh, 14 uur uh, 55 uh, verder met um, hoe je zelf uh, nestkastonderzoek uh, vorm kan geven.